Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. What a difference a week can make. Uh, the Calgary Flames have an interesting week this week with two wins and a loss. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break things down. Matt, I think when we look at this week as a whole, my thoughts are, very, when I, I guess my thoughts, if I have to sum it up in one word, amazing like it's amazing to see that this team can play the way they did in the first two games this this week yeah and that's the frustrating part of how the third game went because it's like you're you just got yourself kind of quasi back into the discussion again and then you just shot yourself in the foot against one of the worst teams in the league and it's like can you guys actually you know show up for multiple games instead of just like two (laughs) well let's break these down on monday the calgary flames were in dallas to take on the stars uh in this game the calgary flames won with five to four against the stars obviously jacob markstrom and net i think they'll be riding him for a while uh to foley scores in a breakaway at the end to to get the calgary flames the win here and you know while yes the flames got four goals scored on them I thought this was a very different Flames team than what we'd seen before. I thought, you know, even from the game uh, against Minnesota and Calgary, when Calgary lost 3 nothing, I thought, wow, this looks like a playoff-caliber Calgary Flames. Well, and that's exactly it. Like, this team in the Boston game was able to show that they could uh, skate with the big boys. And, you know... Uh, it was a very similar story um, where uh, um, that we're, we've been used to, where the Flames get out to a 4-2 lead, cough it up um, late, and then thankfully to fully uh, the breakaway goal with seven seconds left to win it. But, you know, it, this team, like, when they're actually trying and putting in the effort, they can beat anybody in this league. And... You know, like, they walked all over the Bruins a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, like, Dallas is right up there amongst the leaders in the conference, and, like, if the Flames were to squeak into the playoffs, we'd probably play Dallas in the first round. And yet, you know, it, it, it's just frustrating, the dichotomy between seeing this kind of effort and then efforts like we saw last week or uh, in the Anaheim game where, like, there's just no desperation or passion or anything yeah for sure I, I think that's a good way to say it no desperation no passion and maybe that's the way to to sum up this dallas game is the flames looked like they were desperate they knew that they needed some points and they went out there and i mean you know when you get four goals scored on you i often say that you deserve to lose at that point but um you know the flames kept battling back and that's when we don't see from them a lot this year we don't see them battling back we see them you know get three four goals and just crap out So I think the fact that we're seeing the Flames, you know, getting down and then coming back and staying with it, I think that was a very different, I guess, mental look to this team than we'd seen. But you could tell that they needed it. Oh, yeah. And, like, they were actually showing some resiliency in this game, which has been lacking. And even in the the following game, the next night against Minnesota, uh, they were able to have a good amount of stick with itness in order to get the two points and it's like well where has this team been all year and like why can't you just do this like you know it, it like this team is so confounding all season like the flames should not be out of a playoff spot right now like they have enough talent and every all the parts that they need to be one of the top teams in the NHL and yet, for some reason, there is no passion or drive consistently. And it's just, this team is such an enigma because, like, this really should not be breaking down this way. Well, let's talk about that next game. Uh, the following night, the Flames are in Minnesota taking on the Wild. Markstrom made 40 saves in a back to back effort as the Flames won 1 0. And. You normally don't say this about games that are 0-0 going into overtime, which we don't see a lot of, but this was a fun game to watch as a Flames fan. 
Oh, I know. And it reminds me very much of that game uh, a number of years ago when Kipper uh, beat Backstrom in a shootout one nothing, um, which was the first time that that had happened in the shootout era. And it was a very good back-and-forth game. I thought that Minnesota was a vastly better team uh, in terms of generating offensive chances. And Jacob Markstrom, for the first time this season, stole two points. And that's fair to say. For for I should have probably covered this off the top. It was 0-0 after three. It was still 0-0 after overtime. We obviously had to go to a shootout, and it was uh, Nazem Kadri and Tyler Toffoli who scored for the Flames. Matt, it's been almost 16 years since the last time the Flames had a 0-0 tie after 65 minutes. And guess who that was against? Minnesota. In Minnesota. Minnesota. Six, 16 yeah. years ago. Yeah, I know. The parallels are bizarre. Uh, but it's, but, uh, but it, like you said, Minnesota, I think, looked like the better team. And I think it says a lot about the Flames, especially on a back-to-back, that the Flames were able to hold them off. Yeah, and, and like I didn't think that the Flames generated a ton of good scoring chances. It's just, you know, Gustafson's a good goaltender, too. And, you know, he made 26 saves to get a shutout as well, um, which does actually count as a shutout, even though he lost one nothing. Um, and you know, it had to be a little deflating for the wild to score that goal in overtime, get it called back, then having to play the rest of overtime and then losing a shootout like that would be a, a tough to deal. Like if that happened to the flames, I think that this team would collapse, um, which Minnesota bounced back the following game, but. Yeah, just interesting to see, and you know, um, I'm glad that the NHL actually went, even though like the game was over at that point, went back and called the play correctly, uh, and called the offside, and got everybody to come back out because you know they well, could have just. Well, players are saying they're already in various states of undress at that point. Yeah. Yeah, which that that's normal, <laughs> you know, like it's weird for that situation to happen, but. At least, you know, it ended up working out in the end, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I don't think there's much else to say about this game. It was it was an interesting game all the way around. Lots of interesting storylines there. I think it was, again, a game that shows you need to be able to play one-goal games. And Daryl Sutter said this all year long, and I think it shows the Flames can hold their own in a one-goal game. Yeah, and like the Flames have played the most one-goal games in the NHL, and it's just confounding to me that they're not doing better. Uh, yeah, it just it just it's so frustrating because like you see consistently flashes of them being very good, and you know like the ability to shut down a team as good offensively as Minnesota. And Markstrom stepping up and playing as well as he did, you know, it's just like, why can't this team put it all together? Like, it, it just, it's so bizarre. Well, let's talk about where they didn't look good, as you just mentioned, and that was the Anaheim games. The Calgary Flames uh, came home to take on the Anaheim Ducks, um, and that was their one home game of the week. And obviously a game where they didn't look good. The Flames ended up dropping this one 3-1 to one against the Ducks. Matt, this was a game I was excited about. Like, the Flames looked so good on the road. They were coming home. They were going to play in front of their own fans. And, you know, sometimes you can play well and still not have the score you want. But to me, the Flames really did not look good in this game. They they reverted to what we've seen all year long, just inconsistency, not playing well, poor decision-making. No, and like, how would you say, John Gibson is a really good goaltender, and he was not even tested at all. Well, I was going to say, this is not the story we've seen so often for the Flames, which is, you know, they come up against a hot goalie and lose the game. I didn't, I mean, you know, Gibson set a franchise record for most saves here, but... I didn't think it was his best night. No, and it was one of those where, like, yeah, the Flames got out to the one nothing lead, but, you know, like, honestly, this was a game where, like, you know, if you put, like, a AHL goalie or, you know, the emergency backup goalie, they would have got the win. 
you know, because uh, the Flames generated, like, maybe three scoring chances all game, if that. And, you know, like, when you're... Season's on the line. You're four points out of a playoff spot. You can close it to within two. And then you literally do not show up at all. Like, it, 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 it's not even like you had a bad performance. You just didn't show up at all in this game. And it's like, what the hell are you guys doing? Like, are you even professional hockey players? Like, you know, like, do you care? One of the best uh, tweet. One of the best tweets I saw was from a fan who was there who said, "I'm confused if I'm watching an NHL or an ECHL game." Well, pretty much, and you know, like Markstrom, he played well in this game. He didn't have a ton of um, shots against. Um, you know, like it was a familiar refrain where he gave up two goals on the first nine shots, but he there was literally nothing he could have done with either of the goals that Anaheim scored. It, it, it's just that, like, I really do not understand how this team can be this bad. Even, like, the worst teams in the NHL, like Columbus or Chicago, like, even when they're bad and, like, you'll give up five, six, seven goals, like, they show some sign of anything. But, like, this was as flat line of a performance as I've seen since... Well, you know, uh, like there was that game uh, when they were about to trade Ole Jokin into the Rangers, uh, and they got shut out two nothing, and like there, there, there was like a corpse walking, or Game Seven against Anaheim uh, in '06, where like there it was just nothing, and like this was a another one like that where it's like I, I do not understand how a team that can be fighting so hard in the, the two games earlier in the week to try and get back into the playoff pitcher, you have a perfect opportunity to regain your footing and, you know, kind of erase the last, like, six games where you were kind of bad against a really bad team, and you just don't show up. It, like, it just, it's... And I, I think in some ways, you know, and I saw a lot of fans very excited after the uh, after the two game road trip, and you know the Flames were within a few points of the playoff spot, and maybe they can do this. And I think that this Anaheim game really brought perspective, is maybe the best way to say this: that this is still the same Calgary Flames team that we've seen over and over this year. Even though they they strung two wins together, not much has actually changed for this group. No, and it's the same, you know, like, it, frankly, the coaching decisions in this game, I thought, were extremely notable of the lines that were used. And well, let's talk about that, too. Daryl Sutter shuffled his lines up quite a bit in this game, and Matt, why do you think that happened? Do you think that Daryl was just trying to get something going? Well, uh, yeah, anything. Like, you know, guys, show a pulse, you know, at all, and, you know, like, put it this way, if uh, they had... Anaheim had scored a third one after uh, they took the two-one lead. I'm sure that they w he would have probably put Vladar in just to, you know, like wake up, boys. You know, like what are you doing? And you know, it, it, the one play that stood out as emblematic of this game is that play in the third period where the Flames had all sorts of pressure, it looked like they were generating some scoring chances. And then some of the guys went off for a line change, and Mackenzie Weger, instead of just holding onto the puck and waiting for fresh guys to keep them hemmed in the zone, flipped the puck at Gibson from the blue line with no traffic and ended the play, even though they had hemmed the Ducks in for over a minute in their zone. And it's like, what the hell are you thinking? Like, you know, like that's like, honestly, if I was the coach on that play, Weger would not have played the rest of the game. And you want to say that to the whole team, but you got to put four, guy, five guys on the ice consistently. But like literally, all of them had their head up there, and it's like, what are you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, no, but, I but, agree. Like it's just confounding. Like, it, you know, well, somebody's got to show up. The Calgary Flames were, I, I guess, and still are at this point. Closing in on that wild card spot, uh, at this point, the Calgary Flames have 71 points, 66 games played, 29 wins, 
24 losses, 13 overtime losses. But I always like to look at those together because an overtime loss still lost. So that's what, 37 losses to 29 wins. They have 79 points right now, or 71 points, which is tied with Nashville. Uh, and that still puts them six points out of a wild card spot, which Winnipeg holds at 77 points. Edmonton has the other wild card spot at 80 and Seattle 81. So the Flames are really 10 points out of the third spot in the uh, Pacific Division and six points down in the wild card. And I mean, they got close this week, but I, my, let's just say when I look at the week in its totality, I don't feel any more optimistic about the Flames than I did when we talked last week. No, and realistically, like looking ahead, um, like they've played four games this week. And, like, unless the Flames walk away with seven or eight points, like, I think you can put a, a, the final nail in the coffin, like, because uh, they've run out of time. And, like, you can't piss away games like the Anaheim game at, at now uh, for the rest of the year. Um, like, you have to beat the bad teams, and, you know, you have to find a way to win. And they didn't, and, you know, they deserve to miss the playoffs if the, that's how they're going to play. And, you know, the frustrating thing, I think, for me as well is that we keep seeing this Flames team losing games, key games to bad teams. Like, Anaheim is not a good team this year. That should have been, especially after the first two games this week, which were important, this should have been a win for the Flames. And you need to be able to beat those, quote-unquote, bad teams. Yeah. And I, I think that the fact that the Flames keep not being able to do that at key times says a lot. Like this team can't put to, they've had what three wins in a row twice this season. Nothing makes me think that they're going to be able to put together, even if they do make it four and seven. Oh no. And it's one of those things where, you know, if they can show up in the last 16 games and some miracle find themselves in a playoff spot, that's one thing, but you know, you actually have to, Prove it, and... Well, and and I've been thinking about that too, Matt. And I'm wondering, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. Now that we've recapped the week. Do you think it'd be better for the Flames to make it in and, by my estimation, get embarrassed in the first round or not make it? Honestly, I think the players need a slap in the face and you know, um, and miss the playoffs entirely. Um, I agree. I think there's more to be gained this year because I think when you make the playoffs. Fans, management, coaches go, well, we were good enough to be in that top 16. And we're not in the top 16 in the West. I no. think that a message needs to be sent that this is not a playoff team right now. No, and, you know, how would you say, uh, w with missing in the manner that they're trending towards, it, it's looking like, you know, it, it opens up avenues for, you know, not necessarily needing to be tied to certain players for the long term. And, you know, like it, it allows you that flexibility where, you know, if because things didn't work and like there's literally no reason why they should have worked out this way. Um, like, granted, a lot of it has to do with Markstrom being bad for most of the year. But there have been many games where Markstrom and Vladar have shown up and the rest of the team didn't. And, like, in those games, the Flames players are just as responsible as the bad goaltending. And, you know, like, I don't understand why this team can't seem to get all on the same page at the same time. And, you know, like, at this point, even though, like, I'm not a huge fan of Sutter's coaching decisions this year, I think you just got to keep riding with him as the head coach, and I wouldn't change the management either. I think that this team has gone through so many changes that, you know, like the players in the room have to figure it out. And, you know, it, even if that means changing more of the players in the room for other pieces and, you know, even if you have to retool or tear down and rebuild uh, at this point. like it, We you know. don't know, and I think we're starting to hear some rumblings out of the Flames camp if Daryl Sutter has lost the room. And if he has, I think he has to be replaced. Uh, you can't go into another season if the players won't play for that coach. But I think that if that's not the case, I think this team has to come back largely looking like it does now. You're not going to move... Your top six at this point. I think that, you know, the top six forwards are pretty much locked in. And Peltier, Lindholm, Defoley, Dubé, Cadre, if you look at uh, Cadre there and Huberdeau, 
Um, you know, Monjapani, I think, is locked in. Backlund's locked in. Coleman's locked in. So really your top nine. Same on your back end. Uyghur, Anderson, Tanev, Hannafin. I think this team is going to bring back next year. So I think that they've got to figure out why this is an, a good team on paper and didn't do it. And I think they need to solve those problems first and foremost. But I think firing management, firing coaches, while it becomes a an easy scapegoat, I don't know solves the issue as much as I, you know, I've, I've called for Daryl Sutter to not be the coach yeah. at certain times this year. I think I, I don't know. It solves all the issues. No. And that's why, you know, like having the consistency with having the new, like new season, hitting the big old reset button, having guys like Huberdo and, uh, you know, Manjapane, frankly, uh, going off this off season to work on their games to try and figure out how to play more effectively uh, because frankly both of those players have been abysmal this year um you know and try and reset you know like even if um like either of those guys it was even you know like half of the player that they were last you gotta year you got to add Jacob Marks from that too oh i agree um you know it, I, I was yeah, just thinking more of the forwards at the at that moment. But you know, like if um like those two guys were even half as good as they were last year, you know, the Flames are probably in a playoff spot right now. Um you know, just because a handful more goals would have made a huge difference. Uh you know, like we played so many one goal games that, you know, or if like they weren't terrible in overtime like if you split the difference and instead of 13 overtime losses you make it seven overtime losses that six points were tied with winnipeg you know like it's just and i guess when i say that they you know if the coach should be moved or not and i've said this every time we've talked about that this season my question is right now who do you replace them with and i think that you know if the coach should be replaced largely is going to come down to who might be available in the summer yeah, and you know the familiar names of guys like Alan Vigneault, uh, um or like any basically established, you know, cup caliber coaching personnel would be the ideal. Yeah, we, not- we can't bring in another Glenn Gullitson. We can't go with the budget choice or you know Ward or guys like that. They need to be at this point bringing in a an NHL caliber coach. Yeah, the only guy that I would um, go with if uh, going the more bargain route would be the Wranglers coach Mitch Love um, just because he's done a fantastic job with the Flames farm team yep. and that would be literally the only guy that I would bring in that's not like a premier name well and and the other and we can talk Wranglers more another time but another thing I was thinking about the other day um, uh, Tim Hunter who former Flames tough guy who's had a really good track record coaching in junior is unemployed right now. I think he's a good development coach. So I think, I think part of it is he always wanted to stay close to Calgary. Um, but you know, I can see if Mitch Love were to be promoted to the Flames, I could see Tim Hunter taking the reins of the Wranglers. Yep, I could see that too. Um, you know, because I think he's a guy who, even when he was coaching, was always coaching in the Western League, and and some rumors said, or at least his head coach, and some rumors said turned down some jobs because. He didn't want to leave his base here in Calgary. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the uh, one thing I do want to mention is that um, ever since the Boston game, um, credit to Jacob Markstrom for being the Jacob Markstrom that we've known um, since he signed here. Uh, he's a lot more assertive on the ice and uh, making all the saves that he needs to. And I don't a, think it's a too bunch too late though. Oh, I agree, but you know I have to give credit, you know, because we've been slagging him fairly consistently all season, and it's you know thank you for you know finding yourself again, and you know it gives me some hope for next year. Like if he was consistently bad uh, mm-hmm. right through to the end of the season, then it's like okay, we need to trade this guy. You're right? Yeah, he's shown he can still do it at the NHL level. Yeah, and since it, his since his kid was born, and, and you talked a little bit about some of those pressures last week, he's shown he can still do this. But I guess even if the Flames manage to sneak into the playoffs, I think it'll be because of Markstrom. But even at that point, we have to remember 
he's been a large part of the problem for the rest of the season. Oh, I know. And it, it's one of those where, like, frankly, like if the Flames uh, did make the playoffs, uh, you know, and they're going to play either Vegas likely or Dallas, just, you know, um, as of right now, um, you know, like the pressure is entirely off of them because, you know, like they should be like a five game and out type team. So, you know, it, anything more than that would be awesome, but I doubt it. <laughs> um, just cause we haven't seen any consistency from this team. So we'll see, you know, it, it's just frustrating all the way around. It's frustrating, but you know, it's not just this season. I mean, this season, I think, especially because of expectations, but Matt, this is what we become used to as Flames fans. Oh, for sure. And like mediocrity reigns. Like the Flames have been basically a garbage team since 1989, uh, to be blunt. You know, like they, they've had a couple of spots where they've not been completely terrible, but like literally since 89, they've won, had three guys to win playoff series winning goals Matt Stage and Johnny Goudreau and Martin Jelena three times. Like, you know, five series wins in, you know, 33 years, that's beyond pathetic. And like this team needs to. How do you say? It, it's one of those where you either have to like tear, tear, tear it down and be like a Chicago, a San Jose, a Columbus, where you're just bad, or, you know, find out what's wrong and fix it. And, you know, like, this this team is more than happy to, like, the fan base, like, if they're, the team is bad, like, there's no problem amongst the fans for this team to do the proper thing and retool, rebuild, and bring it up properly and like we saw that when we first started our show like the flames like our first season recording we traded again then bowmeister it during our first season recording and like the fan base was more than happy to sit by and wait for guys like monahan goudreau bennett kachuk etc etc to filter their way into the team and it feels like we're at the top of that cycle again yeah, it, the, like this very much feels like that four-year span after the 08-09 season where the Flames were really good, but they could just never quite click it over to make the playoffs, and they'd give it that valiant run and be like the ninth or 10th place team and, you know, miss four years in a row before blowing it up. And, you know, like that's the thing that I'm most concerned of is if this team... You know, like, say this team struggles again next year and is outside of, or, like, eighth heading into the trade deadline with all those expiring contracts, do you keep them all? And, you know, like, this team needs to be able to bite the bullet where if they're not first or second in the their division next year, they have to blow it up. And I think you have an interesting point there. I think, like you were saying, you know, this team has a lot of expiring deals next year, and I think it does give them a lot of options, you know, going into the deadline next year. They could get a lot of value if they're willing to move those expiring deals. Oh, yeah. Like, you're talking getting, like, five firsts back level amount of assets that are expiring. Like, you know, there are a ton of guys that are really dynamite hockey players that, you know, the Flames could make the rebuild go by very quickly <laughs> if yep. they, you know, like... And even if they were to get five first, let's say, I mean, we know what you're living into with picks. Even if he picked two of those and traded three of them, I mean, there's a lot of options there for what you can do when you have that currency. Oh, yeah. Well, look at uh, what Montreal was able to do with uh, Romanoff. Like, they traded exactly. him to... Um, the Islanders got a first round pick, got traded that pick for Kirby Doc, and then got Arbor Jacaj as a walk on who basically replaced Romanoff entirely. And so they ended up with a free Kirby Doc out of the deal, which is a very good, useful piece for them. And I know, take Doc here. Yeah. And it's like the Flames, you know, you can wheel and deal to get that good UFA or RFA guy that's not quite fitting in with Team X. Um, the, you know, make your team better and, 
or just make the draft picks. Like the Flames have a number of good young upcoming forwards like Coronado, like Peltier, like uh, Zari, um, that you know they're basically getting ready. Like even the, the other kid, uh, Peterson, uh, he's looking like he might be worthy of getting a shot in the NHL too. Um, I think the organization still high on Cole Schwint. Yeah. Like there's a lot of guys and like Walker Buer's established himself as an NHL player. Like this team has a lot of good, um, frankly, like second and third line type players um, moving forward. And it's like, you know, if you can expedite, you know, like say the Flames miss the playoffs this year, like the guy that they're going to get in the first round is going to be a guy that's more profiling to be a first line forward. Uh, I'm assuming that they'll take a forward just because the defensemen at that range are not as good. And that's another reason I think it might be best for this team to actually miss the playoffs. I think that, you know, when we look at what they need asset wise, that draft pick can be very valuable either to, to make it or to move it. Yeah. And then like next year, assuming like the boat is the same and we're in the same purgatory zone, um, that you know, if you trade off a bunch of those guys, you're going to get a similarly good draft pick with your own pick, plus you know, like all the draft capital, whether it's like next year's picks or picks beyond that. And like, frankly, like having guys like Cadre and Huberdo on long term deals and Uyghur, it's very much the same kind of a situation like when the Flames had Giordano going through that phase where. You know, like, you you still need veteran NHL guys going through a rebuild if that's how things go. And, like, it it takes a lot less um, time for a team to be able to work through a rebuild if they have guys that know how to um, be NHLers while the team is bad. And, like, you, you see, like, the teams that, quickly rebuild like say like los angeles right like they went into a rebuild but because they had guys like brown dowdy um kopitar etc like they were able to quickly go from being bad to being good again and you know like you see teams that sell off everything like edmonton buffalo and arizona and like you know it's still you know like all this time later like we've been recording for 10 years and like those teams were bad back then and you know like it, it's taken them till now to just even make the playoffs again so you know it, it it's just th- this is not like the ideal way of things breaking down but how last off season happened you know like am i surprised that you know this year turned into what it did not really um you know, the expectation was that Huberto was going to be more of a like 70, 80 point guy instead of a 30, 40 point guy. But, you know, stuff like that happens. And, you know, it, it just, it'll be interesting to see moving forward how, if the Flames are able to commit to rebuilding properly or if they rebound. Like, if they rebound, then, hey, there's no problem. But it's just, you know, we're kind of in this purgatory zone that we've been in continually, and it's, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the new Flames that are here, and maybe guys that we'll see next year or not. Um, flames brought in three guys at the trade deadline, two we've seen in the NHL, one we've seen in the AHL. The first one is Troy Stetcher, and he's played all four games since he's come here. He's been pr- primarily playing on the last defensive pair with Nikita Zadorov. In four games, he's had one assist and one total point. To me, I think Stetcher's looking exactly as advertised. I mean, Stetcher comes to this team, I think you know he's going to be your bottom pair guy. And I think he's done a, a fine job in what they needed him to do. I think he's better than, you know, Gilbert and other options that we've tried there. For the price we paid for him, yeah, I think this is this is a good acquisition for the Flames. Well, the Flames, frankly, have not really had a good quality number six defenseman for a long time. Like, we got a little spoiled last year with Good Branson and Zadorov being a good 5 6 pairing. Uh, but, you know, like prior to that, the Flames consistently had just a mediocre number six. And, 
you know, Setcher is playing a very capable number six. Like, if he was a number five or a number four, he would not be entirely out of place either. And so if the Flames could bring him back for what he's bringing, that's fine. Uh, would definitely be okay with that. If they can get somebody that's a little better for the same price, that also would be not a bad idea. But, you know, they're definitely a-okay if the Flames brought him back. I think for him being a number four, I think that's one of those things you see. I think he'd be a great number four if you're not a playoff team, but I think if he's in the Flames' top four, you need some more depth there. Oh, for sure. It's more of like a in case of injuries, you know, like he could fill in. Yeah, he could be your fill-in number four, but I think if you're going into the season looking at him as, you know, your your yeah. number four, you got some issues. Yeah, you're looking at a season where you're like the Arizona Coyotes <laughs> if he's – in your top four right from the get-go but you know he's definitely a guy who could fill that role for like say two weeks if there's injury trouble yeah for sure and then the other uh flame that was brought in was nick ritchie nick ritchie's played three games here he has one goal and no assists he's been playing primarily kind of on that uh bottom six i think he did get some looks in the top six if i remember um Especially yeah, with during Huberdeau and Kadri, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, yeah, with him, I'm a little less enthused about him coming back, frankly. Um, he's okay. You know, a generic fourth-line filler guy. But I think that's what we expect him to be, right? And we talked oh, yeah. about this last week when we brought him in. He's a, he's a fourth-line filler guy who... who uh, how, how would you say the The thing that I'm concerned about, if... He's brought back is exactly what Sutter did, which is put him with guys that he should not be playing with and basically destroy the line that he's on because he's not a second line forward. And yeah, I mean, we talked last week too, and I think that with him, there is something to be said that there's some potential there. And I think maybe Daryl's trying to see what he's got. And I don't blame him for that, especially with where the Flames are at in the season. I don't blame him for trying at all. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think that we have to be realistic. This player is a bottom six player. Yeah, yeah, a fourth-line guy on a good team. And if they're willing to bring him back in, you know, that um, you know that role instead of his brother or instead of Lewis or a guy like that, I'd have no problem with him coming back as a depth piece. I think he's going to have to take a lot less money uh, if yeah. he comes back, but... And again, for where they want him this year, replacing his brother, I think he's serviceable. I am seeing more offensive upside than his brother, which I think what the Flames were going for. Yeah, uh, true. It, it's just, um, how do you say it? I'd almost like to see the Flames uh, commit more to having younger guys come up um, with more foot speed. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, like, and maybe they don't bring him back either, right? I mean, we talked about it last week. It's a 20-game audition, and I think that Nick Ritchie's one of these guys that will always have a place in this league until he's, you know, in his 30s, let's say. Um, it's just a matter of where he's going to be. Yeah, and frankly, like, uh, the one thing that I, I would like to see the Flames do this offseason is abandon um, the veteran guys on the fourth line. Uh, you know, like, you can get... Uh, fourth line guys that are fat. I, the, the primary thing is they need to have a fast fourth line. Um, like whenever we've seen this, uh, the fourth line this year be successful, it's when guys like Zahorna, Rzitska, Dewar have been on that line and they're driving the play. And all three of those guys are very quick guys. And, you know, like as good as uh, Trevor Lewis has been, you know, uh, and like the Richie brothers. Um, you know, like, frankly, they're not doing anything to constructively help the team. And, like, in terms of keeping momentum and, like, they're not harming the team. It's just they're kind of the prototypical they're there guys. Well, and, and again, I think next year might be different. But I uh, and you and I have a different thought on this. But I think this is fine for this year as you keep some of those guys in the AHL ready for a long playoff run. But I think next year there's guys like Emilio Pedersen. There's you know different guys that I think we can look at and say we're not bringing this guy up because he might be a potential first liner. But even a guy like uh, Walker Dewar, this guy is playing on the fourth line and that's his upside. Why not bring him up now? Yeah, 
Oh, I know. And you, you look at, like, uh, the guy that I would most like to see next year on that fourth line would be actually Connor Zari. And, like, to be frank, like, the the fourth line I'd like to see next year would be Ruzitska, Zari, and Dewar um, moving forward because, A, it's a cheap fourth line, and, B, you know, all three of those guys are quick. And, mm -hmm. you know, let Zari learn... It, just like how they brought uh, Manjapane to play on the fourth line uh, for his first full season here, and then moved him up, you know, because I, 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 frankly, I think that Zari's he played has played so well down and with the Wranglers that the, there there's not really any much more that he needs to down there beyond this season. Like, the only thing I'd fire back is Zari, he's 21 and didn't play a full season last year. We've got him for three years, including this one. I could see them keep Zari in the American League for one more year and promote Phillips instead if they re-sign him. That's something I, I could Well, yeah, the argument. main uh, difference uh, and like the main reason why I said Zari is because um, Ruzitska is more of a natural winger and um, Phillips is a winger too. Um, so like if you had um, Zari First up. First one playing center most of the year. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, and I could even see Pospisil being in that group if they were to bring somebody up, um, maybe Ben Jones. Like, I think there's a lot of guys that you could make the argument that they could yeah. be fourth line guys here. True. I think Zari's one of those guys you're bringing up, like you said, almost like Maja Penny, where you're hoping them to go further. But I think that, you know, some of those other guys we mentioned, I think their upside is fourth line. Well, and how would you say, um, I think like moving into next year, um, like the, this team, I think needs to add more youth in the lineup regardless. Um, like, you know, you can go out and spend if you have the money to, to go add like another second line forward or, you know, insert defenseman here. But, you know, it's one of those where I think that just for a cost saving measure and, um, like if the flames are going to rebuild after next year, um, having those guys having like the full season in the NHL, like, especially like for two years from now, like if the flames say like trade Lindholm to Foley, Backlund, Zadorov, and you know, T Tanev and like, you know, really tear down a huge chunk of the team. Um, which is entirely possible. Yeah, and, and I think this discussion changes based on which way they go. Yeah, but I think like having like a full season for a bunch of young guys like the Rajitskas, the Doers, the uh, Zaris, I think would benefit the team moving beyond next season as well. Sure. Yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah. The last guy that the Flames brought into the uh, trade deadline, we haven't seen in a Calgary Flames jersey, but we have been seen in a Wranglers jersey. He's played four games with the Wranglers, one goal, one assist for two total points, and that's Dryden Hunt, the uh, the guy who already has a place in Calgary and is almost coming home even though he's from Cranbrook. He has been playing down uh, in the Wranglers team alongside Ben Jones and Matt Phillips, um, and he's looked good down there, another veteran guy for them to, you know, just to add for their playoff run. Yeah, and frankly, one of the uh, problems that the Stockton Heat had last year in their playoff run is uh, just a lack of depth. And, and like when they encountered the Chicago Wolves, like the Wolves' depth uh, was what beat them. Yep. And uh, you know, like if Calgary's wanting to go on a long playoff run in, for the Calder Cup, um, they need more depth. And getting a guy like Rubens, um, you know, he's a six foot five defensive defenseman. Sort of like the AHL version of Zadorov. Well, let's Frank. talk about that. So the Flames made one other deal this week after the NHL trade deadline. They made a deal before the AHL trade deadline. This player is not eligible to play in the NHL this year because of that. But the Calgary Flames acquired, acquired Christian Rubin, Christian's Rubens. He's a 25-year-old Latvian defenseman, six foot five, two twenty-seven, who was in, with the Ottawa Senators. The Flames gave nothing up for him. They gave up old future considerations. The guy's been moved around the league more than anybody. Matt, what yep. could have been with Mister Considerations? Well, I know it top just... prospect in a lot of in a lot of teams. Yep. 
Um, with Belleville this year, Rubens had 42 games, two goals, four assists for six total points, and has yet to play with the Wranglers. But like you said, I think this is just another depth move, giving up nobody to acquire, you know, let's say a, a serviceable NH, a serviceable AHL defenseman, a guy who has been in the AHL for a while, um, played three games actually with the Maple Leafs last year, 58 games with the Marlies last year. 22 with the Marlies the year before, like a guy who's been around the AHL and knows that league. This really says to me that the Flames are serious about the Wranglers making a run for the Calder Cup this year and need to just add players. Yep. And, you know, with Wolf playing as well as he has down there, um, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, just hopefully they have a good April. I agree. And Matt, since it's now in the future, let us pause for a moment to consider the Senators. Yes. All right. Trade conditions fulfilled. Cool. We considered them. And it's in the future. Yes. I would like, I would love if Trilivian had to report that to league. It is Saturday, March, whatever at two 32 PM. I thought about the Senators for five minutes. It was neat. Okay. Fulfilled. (laughs) Trade condition. (laughs) Matt. That's right. All right, Rubens, you can buy a place. You're not going back. They've fulfilled their condition. <laughs> I thought about him while I was eating my breakfast. Like, Well, you know, it could be like uh, how they've done in baseball. Like, There was one guy, John McDonald, who played for the Jays, who the Jays traded him, I think it was to Detroit, for future considerations, and that future considerations ended up being John McDonald, and they just ended up getting him back like six months later. <laughs> there you go. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, well, considering this guy's a UFA at the end of the year, who knows? Maybe he does go back to Ottawa. Yep. Um, I guess the big story this week after the loss to Anaheim and the line shuffling, the Calgary Flames saw a significant change to their lines at Saturday practice. I'll go through some of the changes here. Um, Saturday practice, the lines that we saw were Peltier, Lindholm, and Toffoli, line one, Huberto, Cadre, Dubé, line two, Mongepeni, Backlund, Coleman, line three. Lucic, Rzyska, Dur as the uh, fourth line. And then Richie Lewis were the extra forwards. So lines one and three saw no changes per reports. Um, both have performed quite well. But the changes for those that are that are not sure. Nick Richie went from the left wing on line two to skating as an extra. Huberto went from the right wing to the left wing on line two. Dylan Dubé went from center on line four to right wing on line two. Trevor Lewis went from the right wing on line four to skating as an extra. Rajishko went from an extra to center on line four. And Walker Dewar went from skating as an extra to the right wing on line four. So I guess the most significant change there is Huberto goes from right to left and is now on his natural wing. And he's been playing off wing for 30-some games. Um, Do you think that's going to change anything for him at this point? Uh Possibly. Um, I think that uh, having him playing opposite Peltier uh, to accommodate Peltier was a good thing for a long while. And uh, for whatever reason, the chemistry on that line just kind of petered out. Um, and Peltier has looked good on the first line. So, you know, and having Dubé slot in on the second line, Dubé was way better than playing fourth line minutes. Like, whenever he was out there, like, he was the only guy that seemed to be doing well on that line. And he was on our first line for a chunk of the season. Yeah, and, like, he's cemented himself, in my mind, as a top quality top six forward moving forward. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of finding the right spot for him. And, by the way, just um, as a thought moving, like, for, like, a two years from now, if they blow it up next year... I could see a situation where Dubé is like the first or second line center with Kadri being the other, you know, effectively replacing Lindholm. Yeah, I could see that, how that would break down if, um, you know, things continue. But Well, let's look at, yeah, let's look at this season for right now. I could oh, maybe no. see that as well. I I like that Peltier, Lindholm, Toffoli is now the first line. We'll see if they ice that tonight against Ottawa, but I would... Like that line. I think that Peltier needs some of that. I think Lindholm can be a great puck mover there, and I think Toffoli adds a little bit of offensive, uh, you know, offensive drive to that line as well. But I think you've got then Lindholm as your two way guy, and you've got Peltier Toffoli as your scorers. I really like the makeup of that line. Mm-hmm. Same thing on the second line. I think Huberdeau becomes your scorer, and and 
Kadri and Dubé's job is to go and dig for the puck and send it out to him. I think you're definitely rewarding Dubé on that line for his great play, but I think Kadri yeah, well, Huberto is a uh, pairing we need to get going. Yeah, well, how would you say it? With um, Florida, Huberto was very good. If his opposite winger was a guy who was, who was fast and would drive the net, which that, yeah, welcome to Dylan Dubé's game. Like, yeah. <laughs> really. You and know, and like, I think Dylan Dubé. I'm not still sold on him as a legit top six. I think he's filled the role well this year, and we can have this discussion maybe in the off season. But I think you're rewarding him for what we're seeing this year. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I'm glad they didn't touch the Manjapani Backland Coleman line because I think that that's uh, that's a line that's looked great all year. There's no reason to change that one. Yeah. And I like that we're seeing Rajichka back in the lineup. He's been kind of an extra for a while. I think Rajichka Doer on that line. Is fine. I, we've talked a lot about Lucic, but for where they are, I mean, you know, Lucic, Richie, Lewis, I think those guys are interchangeable right now. Yeah, frankly, if I was making one change out of the top 12, I would swap Richie in for Lu- uh, Lucic. Like, frankly, I, I, I kind of wish that the Flames would just kind of park him for the rest of the year because um, he's, he's not doing anything positive for the team. Uh, you know, as much as it pains me to say, like when Lewis, Richie, and like a whole bunch of the farm players are playing better than you, it's like, uh, and you know, I mean, what you're talking about with you know, young players getting some time, you're seeing both Rajesh and Dewar here getting some time. So, I think, I think that's a positive step, especially considering you know, Daryl Sutter's reluctance to play some young players this year, yeah. No, and that's where, like, uh, the general manager moving forward needs to make sure that, like, those options aren't available to Daryl next year. You know, because we do not need a repeat of, like, Lucic or Lucic-like guys who are just too slow, don't really contribute anything, and, like, okay, yeah, they every 10th game they actually hit or fight somebody, but, yeah, okay, cool. Um, you know, and just creating like a black hole in your, you know, like there's a reason why like the flames will get momentum with their first three lines. They'll throw the fourth line out there and like the whole momentum dies. And like it, it's frankly, it's Lucic. Uh, if, yeah. if I had to go with the fourth line, I'd go Richie, Rajichka and Dewar. Same here. I think Richie, Richie is your offensive minded guy there. I think Dewar can fill a lot of the role that Lucic is supposed to fill. And Rajichka sort of, you know, as your center, keeps things keeps things moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And no change to the back end. Uh, Hannafin wasn't in practice yesterday, but was it an optional skate today, so they're expecting the pairs to be Uyghur Anderson, Hannafin Tanev, Zadorov Stetcher. We've seen Hannafin Anderson for a lot of the season, but I'm starting to really like the Uyghur Anderson pair. Yeah. Well, how would you say, um, between the two of them, like it, uh, Hannafin basically, since we've got him, has more or less been flat. You know, he is what he is. Um, where Anderson has incrementally gone up a little bit each year, and in terms of his overall play, and uh, you know, um, Weger overall is a better defenseman than Hannafin, so it makes sense to put best with best, and you know, let it rip. I think you're right. Well, we'll see if they can let her rip this week. The Flames have four games in the docket. Um, you and I didn't do well with our predictions last week. You thought they'd lose all three. I thought they would lose to Dallas and Minnesota, win to Anaheim. So I had the week flipped. Yeah. Um, but like you said earlier, they've got four games, two at home, two on the road, eight points on the table. What do you need to do to be successful this week? You need to get half, I think you were saying earlier. You got uh, seven points. out of seven or eight. Okay. Uh, yeah, you because know, like they're that far behind the the eight ball, where like they by the end of the week they need to close the gap uh, between them and a playoff spot down to three points to have any realistic. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say you got to get six of eight this week to be successful. Yeah, so I will say that they'll run the board just because they need to, and you know if I'm wrong with my prediction, well then you know we're in a different phase of our show for the You're last going couple all weeks. In. Yeah. 
So just so we can break this down for fans, uh, we're recording on Sunday. The Calgary Flames play the Ottawa Senators tonight in the Cell Dome at 7 p.m. Then they go on a quick two-game road trip Tuesday, an 8 p.m. start time against Arizona in Arizona and my favorite named NHL arena, Mullet Arena. Then on uh, the 16th on Thursday, another 8 p.m. Uh, start yeah, time. That, just uh, saying, that really should be the Oilers arena name. Like, it, well, apparently it's named after some guy, and I... I I feel like Mr. T, but I pity the fool who's named Mullet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think you... That's not the name you give your arena. It's not like, you know, Mullet's Incorporated is the corporate sponsor. Yeah, it's just weird. I think it's the only rink in the league now that doesn't actually have a corporate name. Yeah. And that's because it's an NCAA rink. Yeah. Um, so, like I was saying, Thursday, uh, the Calgary Flames in... Vegas to take on the Knights in the 8 p.m. start time. And then they're back here on Saturday, an 8 p.m. start time against the Dallas Stars at home. So you're saying they're going to win all four. See, this is this is tough for me because there's games you should win, but the games we should win, we don't win. Well, you know, like, frankly, my honest opinion is that they probably win two of the four. Um, but they need all four, so that's what I'm going with. <laughs> like, they, they really need all four. Yeah. I don't know. I think they lose to Ottawa. Ottawa seems to have been their kryptonite lately. And, and uh, you know, I, I was going to say that, like, Vegas, because they've never won in Vegas's building. So, you know, those would have been my two losses and the other two wins. But <laughs> All right. I'm going to be not – I'm going to not be as pessimistic as you have the last couple weeks, but I'm gonna th- I think they're going to have a rough week here. I think that they will lose to Ottawa. I think they're going to lose to Arizona because they tend to lose to the bad teams, and I think they lose to Vegas. But I think they will beat the Dallas Stars at home. Yeah. So I think of of eight possible points, they're walking away with two. And I think at that point, um, You're done. the season's done. Yeah. Then you know, then you look at recalling a handful of guys up, uh, like you know, like Wolf and you know Coronado when he or gets even just there. playing guys that we have in different roles. Maybe you start putting Dewar higher in the lineup and see what you got there. Yeah. Oh, for sure, and let her rip and see what you got. And yeah. So yeah, I mean, we've got we've got bad we've got Arizona, which should be a win. You've got Ottawa, which I'd say should be a win, even though Ottawa's coming on. Lately, and then you've got Dallas and Vegas, and I think you know those are two playoff teams that you really show what you've got against the playoff teams there. But I, I just think that if Calgary gets Calgary is coming off a loss, when they come off a loss, they tend to be not good. Yeah, I do know. You think, it, do you think Markstrom plays in all four of these? You have to. I think you just run Markstrom until like they're basically effectively done, and then Matt, you, you split the time. Yeah, I think um, they gave Dan Vladar a shot to earn the net, and I don't think that he earned the net. So I think now they're going to run Vladar until they're out. Yeah. Or sorry, they're going to run Markstrom until they're out. And then I could see Vladar getting some more starts just to get them some starts. But I think until they, they deem that they're out, it's Markstrom's net. Yeah, and like, it, you know, looking ahead, like it, maybe like one game towards the end of the month if uh... – well, next next week they've got back to backs: L.A., Anaheim. They've got Vegas again. They've got San Jose. I can see Marks from getting the San Jose game. Um, yeah. You've got L.A. twice in two weeks. You got Vegas twice in two weeks. Like I could see putting Markstrom in in one of those just to give a team a different look. Um, and then in April, I mean, I can see Markstrom getting Anaheim, Chicago, Vancouver, San Jose. There's a lot of games I can see him getting there, especially if this team isn't fighting for their lives. Yeah, I think Markstrom's going to get the starts now. Once the Flames are out, I think because Vladar is a young goaltender and needs time and needs starts to develop, I think he will get the net once the Flames are out. Yeah, and that's where I could see the Flames also recalling Wolf for you know like any like Monday through Wednesday games uh, yeah. b- between now and the end of the year. And I think that's going to be the keys. If you if you bring Wolf up, you don't want it to affect the Wranglers. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe they bring them up on, like, a Tuesday home game versus Chicago um, and then send them back, which just means moving back down the hall the next day. Yeah. Or even, like, the Tuesday, Wednesday on the 4th and 5th of April. And then, yep. you know. Yeah, we'd have to plot those with the Wranglers schedule and see, 
how they line up. But yeah, anytime the Wranglers aren't playing, especially at home with the Wranglers aren't playing, I think it's it would be a good time to to give them a shot. Yeah, because I how do you say I think that like unless the Flames are like in the playoff push um, down the stretch, like I think that yeah, Wolf definitely plays at least one game this year um, just to get him. Uh, hey, this is what the NHL's like. Have fun. And, you know, uh, as a look at to next year and, you know, also as a reward for his amazing season uh, down with the Wranglers. And, you know, uh, similarly on the 10th and 12th of April, um, the uh, NCAA season is over um, at that point, uh, regardless of uh, like, because I think the championship game is on the 9th. Um, so, um you know, like if um, Matthew Coronado's team is eliminated, I could see Coronado playing on the 10th and the 12th, um, regardless if the Flames are um, in a playoff hunt or not, uh, just so that way he burns a year of his contract because that's why you would sign him uh, mm -hmm. uh, right away. And Yeah, I could know. I could see him um, come here. I don't know if he can play both. I think he can. I think he could come yeah. here, play one game with the Flames, and then play the playoffs with the Wranglers. Yeah. But I guess we'll see. Let's let's wait for the Harvard playoffs to be done first. Yeah. Well, that's the latest that uh, Harvard's playoffs could end is literally the championship game, and it could be any time before that. So, yeah. like He might end up having, like, a five-game stint. And for yeah. all we know, a deal's already done, and they're just waiting to fax it to the league until, you know, Harvard's completed yeah. their season. which entirely makes sense. Yeah, I think that, like, there's, well, Coronado's even expressed interest of, like, like let's get this going. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I'm, like, 100% confident that that will happen, regardless of where the Flames are at. I agree. Well, Matt, I think that's it for this week. We'll see how the Flames do in a pivotal must-win week. And if we are wrong, which I hope we are, because neither of us think they're going to do well this week, or if they can get those six or seven points this week and stay in the playoff hunt. Yeah, and then, you know, like if, uh, you know, they falter and play poorly, um, then, like, the just the focus of our show will uh, shift more into uh, looking at the younger guys and, you know, talking about the Wranglers more and all that kind of stuff as, uh, you know, we're basically running the clock down until the end of the year. Well, let's see what we got to do next week, and we'll let people know then how we'll be focusing. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.